We're excited to be kicking off a new series um, called The Way of Hospitality. The Way of Hospitality. And um, I thought that this would be like an interesting series for us to do uh, for the, the main reason we're doing hospitality and walking through this is because as we think about Vision 2020, we begin to think about greater things because Jesus promised that we were going to do greater things. And then, and then we said, okay, so if, Jesus is, if this is the promise of Jesus, then what's the culture that would support these greater things? Uh, and, and what would we need to live out in order for these greater things uh, to, to come about? And, and, and we said, okay, hey, so there's different cultures that go along with this. There's a culture of expectation. And so we spent several weeks talking about the Holy Spirit. And talking about how the Holy Spirit um, has come and lives within us and is the one person who is enabling us to do these greater things. And, and so that was a, a great deep dive in the person of the Holy Spirit and, and what it means to expect upon the Holy Spirit. And, and we said, but this is a culture that's not just going to be defined by one sort of thread. There's four common threads that are going to come together and we're going to preach on all of them. And so we have the, the thread of expectation and then, and then now we're into the thread of hospitality because we're believing that we need to be a culture of hospitality if we're going to see these great things come about. Uh, we'll talk next about a culture of empowerment, and then we'll finish by talking about a culture of invitation. And so what we're seeing is we have some of these things in place, but we're believing that God wants to make some significant shifts in our culture um, from where we are to where God is calling us to be in order to join him in this vision. So, so check out this um, scripture here that, that kind of guides all of our time, and, and, and we'll walk through it together. And we've been starting every message here. And Jesus makes this promise, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Okay, and so Jesus promises that we're going to do some of the same things that he's doing and even greater works. And so what we've been saying and understanding is the greatest work that Jesus did was he brought the kingdom of God and he invited sinners like you, like me. He, he made a wide invitation to anyone who would receive his grace. They might leave their life of spiritual death and enter into a life of spiritual life. And so that's the greatest work that Jesus did. And he says that we get to join him in that. And so this is the culture, the culture of expectation and hospitality, empowerment and invitation that we believe supports these greater works. And so we want to expect greater things, expect greater things. This is what we mean by that. And so we've been preaching through this. Um, we, we are uh, excited uh, as a church body to be taking steps in uh, each of these areas. And so, like I said, we took a ton of steps over the last couple of weeks in the Holy Spirit and studying the Holy Spirit and w who is he and how do we engage him and how are we filled with him. I thought Sam did a fantastic job uh, last week as he talked about what does it mean corporately for us to be together as a, as a church body and, and uh, expect the Holy Spirit. And so as we transition into hospitality, I think the timing's great. Um, what, what we're doing, one of the great steps that we're doing as it pertains to hospitality is we are actually making a move as a church. Uh, we had a member dinner about a few weeks ago where we discussed how we are actually moving our service location from Atlantic High School to Trinity Lutheran Church and School. We are going to make a move. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's, a, it's a big deal for us. We're super excited about it. We want you to know as a, as a whole congregation, we talked about it with our members. We're going to talk more about it next week and sort of some of the specifics that go along with that and some of the motivation that brought us to this point and how that's going to affect you. But one of the greatest things that we are expecting to come out of this is that we are going to get to practice radical hospitality with our brothers and sisters at Trinity Church and School, and thus tell the narrative of what it means to be Church United to the onlooking community. And so it is a great time of expectation and excitement for us, and we're super pumped. We wanted you guys to know about that. You may have heard different things about it. We'll talk more about the details of it next week. But again, we're really excited to be able to be coming onto their campus. We're going to be worshiping in our own separate space. You know, they'll be worshiping. We'll be worshiping. We'll be, we'll be together, though, for the gospel in our own different unique expressions. And, and we're just super pumped about it. The actual time uh, when we're going to go is the Sunday after Easter. Okay, so don't show up there next week. 
They'll be like, what are you doing here? Like, you're like, I'm looking for the avenue. Okay, you, you, you'll, you'll be a bit confused as, as will they. We're going to be going, our first service will be um, actually the, the Sunday after Easter. And, uh, and we're super excited to be able to, to do that. And actually, we're going to kick off our time there with a big old unity service. We're all, we're, we're going to be coming together and worshiping as one body. How cool is that? It's going to be an awesome way to kick it off. Celebration, food, fun. It's going to be an amazing time to see Church United like actually come to life, to practice this way of hospitality. So I'm pumped. I hope you guys are too. If you have questions, make sure you can kind of like think about them, email us, but we're going to be talking about the plan in more detail next week. Hey, let's pray and, uh, and we'll hop into what that looks like for us today. Father, thank you so much that your Holy Spirit dwells within us, empowers us, and calls us to these greater things. Lord, we know that hospitality is critically important to seeing the number of Christ followers double in our area. God, we know that, that your son prayed that the church would be one so that the world would know. So we're believing that as we practice the way of hospitality, we're actually going to see greater evangelical fruit. We're believing that this is your strategy. We're leaning into you, our King. We love you. We pray that you would fill us with your spirit and actually equip us to walk in these ways. In Christ, in your name, amen. Amen. Cool. Hey, if you guys have your Bibles, we're going to be uh, in Luke chapter 17. Uh, that's where our study is going to be coming from today. And, and like I said, man, we are super excited to talk about hospitality. And, and we're going to define hospitality for you. And some, some of our definition for hospitality kind of comes from uh, our study of the, of the Alpha movement that started in London and has made its way over here to the United States. And, and they define um, hospitality in this really cool way. I mean, you might have a different thought of what hospitality is. Maybe it's an event. Maybe it's having people over to your house. Um, maybe it's just kind of uh, like, a, like a way of life. I don't know how you would define hospitality, but I loved how they defined it, and that's kind of what, what, what we're going to use. And so if you have your bulletins there's a, or your outline, there's a fill in the blank. That, uh, that, that's where we are sort of in the, in the message. And it's this idea... Remember, remember for the last sort of like eight weeks, we had to fill in the blank when we were talking about the Holy Spirit and we we're saying, we need another what? Oh yeah, awesome. All right, great. So some of you got that. We need another person. So we looked at for like eight, maybe even nine weeks, the fact that we need another person to accomplish these greater things. Like we're not it and the Holy Spirit is. Cool. So we have another fill in the blank that's going to guide our time for the next five weeks. And we're not talking about needing another person, although we still do. We need to prepare for the other. We need to prepare for the other. We're going to define hospitality, gospel hospitality, as preparing for the other. And, and the cool part about a definition of hospitality that's that simple and that broad is it takes it out of just an event and it actually makes it a way of life. Most of us might think that, well, I'm going to be hospitable on this day because I'm having people over and then I'm going to go back to my normal life. But gospel hospitality is actually a way of living where whether people come into your home or not, you can actually live the way of hospitality because if you follow the ministry of Jesus, you're going to see that he spent most of his time in other people's homes, not necessarily inviting them into one certain place or time, preparing for others. It's the fact not only that you expected others to show up, but that you actually prepared for them. So if we were to take the example of a meal, it would be one thing for me to have you over and then cook what I like. Hey, come on over. I'm going to make some of my favorite ribs. We're going we're gonna to like pound some chocolate chip cookies. And, uh, you know, we're going to get some uh, sautéed, uh, what do you call those long things? Br uh, not Brussels sprouts, but... Um, asparagus and um, you know it's just it's gonna be this great night and we'll probably have some mashed potatoes in there and, but you're a vegetarian and you're like you know and you're avoiding sugar that's I might think I'm being hospitable but really I'm just kind of meeting my own needs and asking you to come along being hospitable would really be like hey what do you like to eat how do you like the t do you like it hot do you like it cold when do you like to eat do you have kids do you not have kids like any special dietary needs. It would be thinking and then preparing for you to actually come into my house. It would be cleaning up the chaos that defines my house probably right now by, by a Sunday morning. It would mean, hey, I'm thinking that you're going to be over here and I want to think through what are some ways and environments that will make you feel at home here. 
It's getting out of myself and actually preparing for you. And so as we think through uh, biblically hospitality, what does that mean and how do we act out on that? That's, that's going to be our, our defining, our defining uh, sort of working uh, statement, preparing for others. You need to prepare uh, for others. And so um, we're, we're going to take a look at uh, probably one of the most hospitable places that many of you have never been to. Can we get a picture of it? There it is right there. The Ritz. Now, you might hang out at the Ritz, like, all the time. That might just be a weekend getaway for you, and that's super cool. You are totally welcome here. We love you. But if you're like me, I have been to the Ritz-Carlton once in my life. I mean, you know, like, as a guest where I got to stay and I didn't have to sneak around and hope they, they didn't ask for my key number. Maybe I've done that. Maybe. Okay, but there was one time, and it was when I had finished seminary, and I was like, man, I... I wanted to give this gift to my wife because, like, you know, one of you gets the degree, but actually the other one does all the unseen work and sacrifice and doesn't really get the applause. And so I'm like, you know what? That's Kath. We're going to go to the Ritz. And so we went to, it's not the Ritz anymore. I forget what it's called. I can't pronounce it, but it's in Manalapan. And, and so we went there. And it was this amazing experience. And one of the things that I remember most about going to the Ritz with my wife was besides the fact, like, this is a really cool gift for her that I'm cashing in on, right? It's like one of those gifts where we both win. But besides, I, I picked up the phone as soon as we got in the room and they knew my name. They were like, hello, Mr. Cleveland. Is everything to your satisfaction? And, you know, I'm like, well, are you, are you looking for my dad? Who's Mr. Cleveland? How do you know I'm here? Like, what you, wow, that's really cool that you kind of knew all this stuff about me. It's almost like you prepared for me to be here. Wow. And so I did a little research on, on the Ritz, and um, I think this might be the one in Montreal where we were, we were not sure, because that's the one that was voted on this, like, I think it was Forbes or some magazine that I was looking at. Like, the number one most hospitable place in the Marriott chain was this Montreal um, Ritz-Carlton. And, um, and at the end of this, this, this five weeks, if you can give me back all of the notes that we're giving you in perfect order, we're sending you and a friend. No, no it's, not, it's totally not true. But we are going to Trinity, so okay, you know, <laughs> consolation prize. Um, I looked up their, like, some stuff on the Ritz, right? Like, what are they about? And, and this, is the, this is part of their credo. Credo. I don't even know what a credo is, but it sounds really important. This is part of their credo. The Ritz-Carlton experience, check this out, enlivens the senses, instills well-being, and fulfills even the unexpressed wishes and needs of our guests. Would that not be cool of somebody to say about you or your family or your church? I'd be like, oh, Avenue Church, that's a place where that enlivens the senses. It instills well-being and it fulfills even the unexpressed wishes and needs of our guests. That'd be pretty awesome. Because every one of you have unexpressed needs and wishes that can only be filled in Jesus. And how awesome would that be if that's what somebody said at, at, like, at your funeral, at your, at your memorial, at, at, about this church or whatever. Like this was a person who when I got around them, these things happened. They went on to say at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, we are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. This motto is exemplifies the anticipatory service provided by all staff members. Anticipatory service, preparing for others. Man, what an awesome way to live. I mean, imagine living like that and having people think that about you and then getting the, getting the opportunity to say, you know why your life is better when I'm around? Do you know why your senses get enlivened and you start to be more creative and you have a sense of well-being and you think that even your unmet needs are met when I'm around? Because the person of Jesus lives within me. You want to talk about a, a gospel apologetic? Let's get a bit more hospitable so that we have some ground to stand on when people ask us, what is it about you that I want to be around? That's where we're going. That's where we're headed. That's where Jesus gives us this pattern. And so as we, as we think through kind of some, some of the ways that this happens, we're going to spend some weeks on some real practical application on how does this become a reality for both you, your family, and this church. Luke 17, uh, verses 20 and 21. Here's what Jesus says here. 
He was being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. The kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Hey, so here's the situation. Luke 17 um, is, the author is Luke. He's a physician, so he's taking detailed notes. Uh, and, and he's, he's um, working through the life of Jesus, and he's recording it. And in this particular chapter, uh, he, we're, we're starting to see some kingdom talk, some kingdom teaching, if you will. And so we see Jesus talking about what it would, some kingdom values at the beginning of Luke 17. And then we see Jesus living out kingdom reality when he heals these 10 lepers. And then we see Jesus um, uh, highlighting the main core kingdom value when he talks about the one leper who came back to thank him. And, and, and then he talks about the expectation of the kingdom and what, what to expect and how will we know when the kingdom comes and things like that. And, and, and basically what Jesus is doing throughout this whole passage is what he did throughout his whole life. He invited people not only to the kingdom of God, but to the king of that kingdom. And, and in this particular passage, after, that's kind of the context of it, this is where we're going to spend a little bit of time. Um, he, he, he says this. He's like, um, the kingdom cannot come through your observation. Can we get that first slide up? Yeah, perfect. Of the, of the scripture. Perfect, thank you. Here's what he says. The Pharisees are asking him about the kingdom of God. And they're like tell us about the kingdom, but they're not asking him like you and I might ask him in a, like a really, um, man, I just, I'm really curious about that. I want to know a bit more about that. No, they're coming with him in some hostility. They, they know that he's been making these claims. They're aware of his miracles. They know that he is like a big problem for them because he's upending their whole system. Because see, religious systems are based on what you do. And if you're a leader in a religious system, you get power based on your performance. Your prestige is kind of based on how well you're doing. And what Jesus is saying, he's flipping that upside down, and he's saying, it's not about your performance, it's about mine. And if it's about my performance, then anyone can come into the kingdom. They just have to come through me. Let well, threaten the religious leaders. So they come and they ask Jesus, well, tell us, tell us, tell us more about this kingdom of God. And we know that it's a, hus a hostile crowd, not necessarily from this, but because this word right here, observed, when Jesus answers, he's like saying, the kingdom of God cannot be observed by your like a technical data or by, by the way that you're trying to observe it. And, and in the original language, it's translated as like you, you're angry, you're hostile, you're coming at me, you're like, you're throwing some like shade on me. I feel haters are hating right now. And Jesus is saying, you're not going to observe the kingdom through your critical lenses, through, through the way that you've always done it. As a matter of fact, you're, you're, it's going to come in a different way. Next slide on, the, on that um, scripture. Perfect. The kingdom of God, behold, the kingdom of God is actually in your midst. So as we kind of think through this, if, if you have your Bibles there, you're going to want to underline and highlight these, these two concepts, kingdom of God and in your midst. So what is the kingdom of God? Um, briefly, the kingdom of God is, is really simply the rule and reign of God. It's the rule and the reign of God. And when we talk about the kingdom of God, when Jesus prays, may your, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, like God rules and reigns over everything, period. But the more we see these greater works of Jesus, the more we see people like myself leave fearfulness and selfishness and come to life for Come, come alive for Jesus and start loving people, the more that happens in your life as well, the more the rule and reign of God is actually made known to the world. The more the rule and reign of God is actually expressed. And so the person who expresses mostly the rule and reign of God is Jesus. So when he came, he broke the kingdom in, in a really new and expressive way, and then he invited us to join him in the breaking in of the kingdom. You with me? So that's the kingdom of God. And here's what he says. The kingdom of God is not going to be observed through your critical performance-oriented ways. He's like, the kingdom is actually in your midst. 
And what he was referring to in the in your midst is that wherever the king is, there also is the kingdom. Wherever the king is, there also is the kingdom. So the kingdom of God this morning, I don't know, I don't know you can probably answer this for you, but the kingdom of God this morning um, was down Atlantic Avenue, walked on A1A, got a, got a little Americano at Pure Greens, and then is now here because that's where I was. The king lives in me, and as the king lives in you, where you go and are faithful to the king of kings, there too goes the kingdom of God. And Jesus is saying, hey, it starts with me. It starts with me. In, in your outline, you've got another fill in the blank there. It's all about the king. The kingdom of God is all about the king. Let's make no mistake about it. So as we talk about hospitality and expectation and the Holy Spirit, all these things, we always make it about Jesus because that's what life is all about. It's always about the king. And because it's always about the king, what's really cool is the king had a way about him. The king had a way of hospitality or, or like what you might say is a kingdom pattern. And that's what we're going to look at as we explore this the next couple of weeks is what is the kingdom pattern? How did the kingdom come? How is the kingdom coming? There's an actual pattern to the kingdom. And this is what it looks like. Love, know, speak, do. These are very familiar terms. If you've been around the avenue at all, if you've been to our, any one of our counseling and communities, if you've been to a redemption group, all things I highly recommend. We've got redemption coming up here in a couple of weeks, man. Make sure that you sign up, get your space. That is a hugely transformative thing for us at the avenue. It's kind of how we do family well. And it's based on some of these very patterns. If it's all about the king, then we should study how did the king bring his kingdom? Because he probably brought it in a radically hospitable way that could also define how we live radically hospitable. And this is what we see here in the kingdom pattern. We see love, knowing, speaking, and doing. These come um, to give credit where credit's due is, is from Paul Tripp and his uh, Instruments in the Redeemer's Hands. Gr amazing book. And uh, he fleshes these out. And these are going to help um, sort of be the, the handlebars uh, for our series. And, and, and the first one is love. Love. The order of these is really important. The order of these is really important because the Christian church um, oftentimes can be really good at this one right here speaking. Like, we can be really good. As a matter of fact, sometimes we set ourselves up to highlight the speakers. It's like, you know, whoever's teaching or preaching or, or, or like um, reading some material and then sharing it with somebody else or when you read your Bibles, all of those things are good things. But oftentimes, um, if we're not careful, when somebody comes to us for relationship, we give them the speak. We share a scripture with them or, or we talk into their lives without having properly loved them and known them. And I understand there's, there's potentially a time and place when you just kind of get right to it, but the pattern of our lifestyles should not be that we speak first and then figure out relationship as we go. The pattern of our lifestyles should be that we love people and then we know them and then we've earned the right to now speak to them and then we get to do life with them. Well, where do I get this? Like, th this isn't just like a cool creative way. This, by the way, is how the whole church has been based on. People don't know about the Avenue Church that I do this, I will do this constantly throughout the community when I ask to speak. I will talk about loving people, knowing people, speaking, and then doing. Why? Not because it's original to us, but because it's original to the kingdom. Because it, it, is this Jesus' pattern? Well, let's take a look at it. Jesus had great comfort and beautiful, harm, harmonious relationship with the Father. But because he loved us, he was willing to go where we are. See, love is all about leaving where you are and going to the other. Having prepared for the other, now our first step is not to invite them to where we are, but to actually go to where they are. So, so loving is all about going to where people are. Knowing is all about knowing who they are. It's all, it's all about um, being able to dwell with people and, and enter their stories. Speaking is, is not simply... Um, sort of as we call like scripture grenading people and running off. It's sharing gospel truth with people, primarily pointing them to Jesus over and over and over again with a commitment to do life with them 
as God goes through the oftentimes slow transformational process. This is exactly what Jesus did. So he, he left the right side of the Father. He left being with the Father in order to be with us. And then he spent 30 years before he did any public ministry just being with us, knowing us. You know, Jesus is, he is um, incredibly famous for asking questions. I think I read a stat where there's 25 times he's, act, he's asked a direct question that would just require a simple answer, and 21 of the, those times he responds with a question. He, he was not a big statement maker. I know he's the I am this, and I, am, I, I totally get it. But he was this like, really loving, nuanced question asker. Because in the, in the asking of questions, people get known, as opposed to people get talked at. So what did Jesus do? He left us. He loved us. Then he knew us for 30 years before he went public. Well, what did he do? Tempted in every way. He knows us. Then what did he do? Then he spoke. Then he began his public ministry. Three years. And the, the three years of speaking was a lot of inviting people not to any kind of religiosity, but inviting people to himself. And then he did what you and I could never do. He went to a cross with no sin of his own. And he said before he went, that he was the Lamb of, he, he affirmed that he was the Lamb of God, that he was the one that was to come. John the Baptist said, there's the Lamb of God, and Jesus was like, yeah, that's me. And, and he said that although, basically, that, that although we will not measure up, that although we, we have sinfulness and brokenness and things that separate us from a holy God, that he would be the Lamb. He would be the one who goes in our place to the cross, and he would take the penalty of our sin. And on the third day, he would, he would overcome it. He would be brought back from the dead so that people like you, people like me, could also overcome through his work. He said it would happen. He said he would die. He said he would be brought back from the dead. He said that anyone who would repent, which means change their mind on where their life is found and believe that it's found fully and most beautifully in Jesus, man, anyone who was willing to do that could come and receive his forgiveness, even you this morning, wherever you might be, can make that same choice of heart today. And then he went out and did it. And now he invites us to come with that same pattern and share that with those around us. Love, know, speak, do. Today we're, we're kind of focusing more on the, on the love aspect um, because I, like I said, we're going to spend a couple of weeks on each of these, and, or a couple of weeks in this whole series, and so we'll have time uh, for, for others of these as we work our way through. But as we think about love, I was thinking about this um, and just kind of how it affects me personally and maybe how it affects you personally. What does it mean to go to where people are before you invite them to anything that you're involved with? I mean, I think about this as far as like um, Easter invites, Right? You have, um, we have some Easter invites that just came in, and uh, I think we'll stuff the bulletins with them next week, but you can pick up one on your way out. Our Easter service will be here. Man, it's going to be a great time. But you know what would be really hospitable? Before you pass that out to a stranger, to actually go to them with no invitation to come to something that you're involved with and just kind of like enter their world, get to know them, understand who they are, so they don't feel like a project being invited and checked off a list, they feel like somebody that you actually love and care about. And whether you get to the invitation or not is very secondary to how well you love them. That's kind of, that's kind of what it looks like. It's to enter people's world before you ask them to enter yours. That's what we did as a church. You know, we just spent time talking to like the mayor. We went to treatment centers. We just hung out in Delray and was like, hey, we want to know you before we invite you to anything because this is the pattern of the king. This is what Jesus did. This is how Jesus entered our world. He loved us. He knew us. He spoke to us. Then he did for us. We are patterning our church and hopefully our lives after that same way. And I was thinking as far as going to specifically, because that's kind of our theme today, going to before we make any kind of strategic invite. I thought, man, what are some awesome, like really relevant ways where we can enter into people's world? Well, certainly asking questions, um, actually going to where they are, like, like entering their workspace or entering um, the, the local coffee shop or entering the, the, the commerce of the Delray, Boca, Boynton area, like, like being out with the people, 
Maybe even taking some of our studies and DNA groups, which are small groups that gather to study God's word deeper. Maybe, maybe going out and thinking to be, where, where can we take this that's going to be more outward focused potentially? Not that there's anything wrong with doing stuff here. Not this gathering's cool. We do it here. We've got classes throughout the week. But, but thinking about how can we intentionally, if we're going to gather, how might we gather where people already are? How might we be able to relevantly enter people's story? So there's an actual physical ramification of this, me kind of going to community. There's, there's the practical outworking of just asking good questions. Like before I make any invite, like let me get to know you. Let me enter your story before I ask you to enter God's story or my story. But one of the ways that I thought was, was pretty critical and, and really relevant to me was, was vulnerability. You know, because here's the deal. Hospitality is not an event. Hospitality is a way of life. And one of the greatest ways where you can go and meet people where they are is to actually be vulnerable with your own reality right now. Here's how it plays out. Um, I read this article last night, and I highly recommend it. It was called Mental Illness, Jesus and Me. And it was written by this guy named Scott Sauls. And uh, so if you want to look it up, uh, go for it. I highly recommend it. I don't, know, I don't know Scott. I've, I've read some of his stuff before. Last night, I'm getting ready to just kind of do my thing, get my worship on. Saturday nights, that's kind of just, you know, hang out, throw some headphones on, and worship Jesus. Um, March Madness was on, okay? Full disclosure is right there, but I'm getting ready to check out a little bit. And I start reading this, this article. I'm reading it. I'm reading it. I'm like, dude, this guy... This guy knows me. This guy's speaking my language. And then I read this one paragraph, and I feel this warm tear just like start falling down my eyes. And I'm like, this dude like knows my soul. I have no idea who Scott is. I have no idea who his story is. But because he talked about his own struggle with anxiety and depression and how that works out for those of people who are, who any, anybody, and, and specifically for those people who are work, walking through a pastoral ministry, I was like, man, you have come to where I am, and you understand me. I'm, I'm, I'm with, I can go with you, dude. I can get behind you. I can listen. I can follow. Like, you want to invite me to something? I'm there because you met me through your own struggle of anxiousness and, and depression. You were open with it. You were vulnerable with it. You talked to me about the darkness of your night, and it made it okay to have a darkness of my own night. It's like he's never stepped foot in my home. He's never come to the Avenue Church. But because of his vulnerability, he broke into my reality, and now I'd be willing to go where, pretty much wherever he wanted to invite me. The way of hospitality, loving people and entering their stories can often be best translated by simply being vulnerable about your own living reality. Because in that, you've gone where many people are and didn't realize you would come. The way of hospitality. Love, know, speak, do. John 3.16 gives us some more thought to what this would look like. For God so loved the world that he gave, or he sent, or he went. We see this here again when the Gospel of John talks about the God, the, the God of the Gospel. And here's how he defines God's love, the fact that he was willing to give or to send or to go. It reminds us that when we want to love people well, we go to where they are, to where they are. And so I thought about this, a, cost, a, a culture of hospitality, you're filling the blank there, goes. A culture of of hospitality goes. If we're not first going, we can't really consider ourselves a culture of hospitality. We might be doing a great campaign inviting. We might, doing some, we might be doing some really cool stuff on social media and Facebook and Instagram, all these sort of things. And, and we might be like handing out uh, like 5,000 invites to Easter. That, those aren't bad things, but those don't define a culture of hospitality unless we've first gone and enter people's world. I was thinking about a culture of hospitality in my own home. Uh, I'm, I get, I'm, I'm trying to create one. I, I wouldn't have called it that until I began this study, but, but in, in my home, there is an unspoken rule. 
If you ever, for any amount of period of time, needed a home and you found yourself as a Cleveland, you would have to fall under this rule or tradition, if you will. And here's the tradition in the Cleveland house. When somebody comes home, you stop what you're doing and you greet them at the door. That's the rule. It doesn't matter what you're doing or who you are or whatever. Like when you hear the door open, you leave your run reality and you go to that person because in the going, there is a message being sent. You with me? So let me just give you an idea of how kind of this works out in my own home. So um, each of the members of my own home have a different way of, of going to me. And so, and it doesn't always work out perfect. So like I'll, I'll just start with um, my, my 13 year old, Cole. So when he hears the door open, he comes to me and, and he's kind of like, hey, what's up, daddy? And he still calls me daddy. Okay, I make him because uh, we're not done with that yet. He still calls me. He's like, hey, what's up, daddy? And, and we hug and stuff like that. And, and it would be more of a greeting like, so look, I'm really glad you're home. It's super cool to see you. I love you tons. And here's what I got. I got a six o'clock youth group followed by a seven o'clock hangout with Teddy. And I could probably fit you in at 9.30 to 9.45 tonight if you want to have a man-to-man. So you let me know. But, but, I, but I'm here, okay? So that's kind of his greeting to me. That's, that's his world. And then I have, I have a, um, a three-year-old little boy named Cade. And when Cade comes to greet me, his greeting is he runs to me at the door. He, no, he jogs to me at the door, and he's very cautious of me because he thinks I'm probably going to take him away from one of his favorite places, which is home. He loves home. So he's always like, you know, we're not going to do one of those weird adventures, Daddy, where you take me away from my Legos or you take me away from my men. And so he's greeting me, but he's a little bit skeptical. I still get a hug and a kiss, but it's a little bit like I'm, I'm kind of occupied over here, but I know this is a weird rule that you enforce. And um, then I have my wife. And, and my wife, um, you know, she, she is, this, she has a saying sometimes, sometimes we just break the rules. And so sometimes she breaks the rules here. Okay? And she'll be like all cuddled up under, and we have a couple of throw blankets. She'll be all co- covered up, and she'll see me, and she'll be like, fool, I'm not coming. <laughs> you crazy. Here I am. I finally got to this position. You know somebody's probably dead in the house. You find them, and then you come to me. Okay? So s- sometimes she'll come. Sometimes, and then when she comes, sometimes it's like, hey, baby, tapping out. You're in. Bye-bye now. Have fun. <laughs> okay? Not always. Not always. Okay? But Anyway, so she has her own varied way of greeting me. And then I have my 17-year-old daughter. And when she comes, she's like, Dad, D, Daddy, listen, because it's still still going on. Basically, look, I'm so glad you're here, okay? You and I know we're like soulmates, and none of these other fools understand me. So I'm glad you're here, okay? And so what are we going to do tonight? We're going to bake some cookies. What are we going to do? We got got March Madness. What's going to happen? And so so she's got like kind of this like, hey, man, this is is happening. I'm, I'm glad... I'm glad you're here. And then I've got this other just turned three-year-old little girl named Cora. And when Cora comes, you have got to be braced. I go down on my knees because I want to go to where she is. And she comes running up at me like, oh my goodness. Dude, where have you been my entire life? You are the best thing that I've seen ever. Get in here. And she just like gobbles me up. And it's like, man, daddy, you're the, I couldn't even imagine a better thing than you. Can we go to a water park? That's exactly like, that's how it works, just like that. Can we go to the pool? Can we get, can we? Okay, and so, and so they each have like their different way of, of greeting me, and, and each of their greetings say something different, kind of about how they've prepared for me or what they expect of me. And so as a church, when we go, depending on how we go, and depending on how we enter people's world, it says something about what we expect from them, what we expect from ourselves, what we expect from our God. The way that we go pronounces the gospel before we even say a word. Are you with me on that? So how you, should, how you go to different people, your neighbor, your community, your nonprofit, your work, your family, you should think about the way that you're going to go to them because it is going to say something distinct about the God who has sent you. In this culture, when we see one another, I love to see people. I love to see little kids because I, I, I always want to go down on their level and talk to them eye to eye. If we're ever in a conversation, I want you to know that I'm going to let them interrupt us because I want them to know their value in the house of God. And when I see you, my first move does, it's not always, but my first move should always be to go to you and embrace you and let you know I'm so glad that you are here and in this family. When we start living like that, the world is going to catch that there's something different 
about this God we keep inviting them to. And so as we close our time out here today, uh, I'm going to just ask the team to come out. and We're going to have our prayer partners. You're one of our prayer partners. You can come on forward. And we're thinking about how this plays out for us as a, uh, as a culture of hospitality. We're thinking about what does this look like in our, both our AC home and our real neighborhoods? How do we begin to practically work this out in our AC home here and in our real neighborhoods? Because check this out. If it's not real in your own home, it's not going to be real out there. It's just going to be another program you, you do. But we've got, we've got higher hopes. We've got higher hopes for our God and, and what he wants to do. We have these greater works that we've been called to. Well, we want to see 200 people get baptized over the next two years. And we've seen God bring at least 12, maybe 16 people so far since this Vision 2020 into baptism. That's amazing that God is already on the move. And he may just blow out that 200 number like, why did you even insult me with a number that low? But he's asking us to join him. And one of the greatest ways we can join him is through a culture of hospitality. What does that look like sort of here in, in our own home? Well, we, we want to start something called 100 Meals. Hashtagging it 100 Meals. And um, basically, actually, I'm sorry, hashtag 100 Meals AC. And the idea is that um, we've got about 170 odd members here in the church. And we're asking you over the next um, four weeks of this series that at least a hundred of you would invite other people in our church over into your home or go out with them, whatever works in your cultural context, and, and break bread and have a meal with them. And we're asking that it would be people that you maybe haven't had dinner with in a while or you've never had dinner with or it's somebody that's a complete stranger to you and you're willing to kind of take that risk. But we're hoping to see over the next four weeks a hundred meals shared within this AC context because something special happens when you break bread together. We're actually going to talk about that in the weeks coming. And so that, that's one of our challenges for us as a, as a, as a church community that we would be able to, to see a hundred hospitable moments of people actually going and inviting somebody else in our church community either over to their home or out to, to a dinner and they would be breaking bread and, and we would be practicing this idea of going to over the next couple of weeks. We want you to report that in. We want to celebrate that. So if you're on social media, go ahead and snap a photo and then hashtag it uh, 100 meals AC and, and uh, put it on whatever platform format that you're comfortable with. And we would love for you to also um, share this with the church at, at info at the ac.com. Just let us know, hey, we went to dinner with so-and-so and it was awesome. We want to be able to celebrate this along the way that we're actually practicing this in-house. The other thing that we're going to be doing is, is this, um, this uh, exercise called The Art of Neighboring. The Art of Neighboring is a book um, that is all about going to your actual little literal neighbors and beginning significant contact and relationship with them. Jesus said, hey, love God and, and love others and, and love your neighbors and don't miss your neighbors. And I think that sometimes we go out into an undefined city while we miss the people who actually live literally right next to us. I know this is true for me. They did a study and it was like 10% of the people could name like six of their neighbors, their surrounding neighbors. And so we, because we want to be a culture of hospitality, because we want to be a culture that goes, there's going to be an exercise each week that we follow from the art of neighboring that helps us to engage with our neighbors. Um, there's going to be some just like a, a real simple like map where you can start to write in the names of your neighbors and you can start to write in some details and maybe ways you're praying for them or whatever. But we're, the idea is that we're going to be way more intentional than we ever have been about loving our actual specific neighbors and going to them. And the art of neighboring is going to help. And so this week, what we're asking you to do is maybe, maybe have one of those meals with somebody else here in the church, but also then just, just prayer walk your neighborhood. Maybe even the, the eight or nine or 10 houses around you. Just, just walk that area and bring the kingdom of God physically with you as you walk and, and, and pray over what God's gonna do over the next couple of weeks. 
where he's gonna send you as a local missionary to love and to know and to speak and to do with those actual literal neighbors. So this week, would you just commit to like, like Joshua walked around the walls of Jericho and then they fell and the kingdom of God invaded. Would you walk around your neighborhood and just pray? I'm not saying to go pray with your neighbor. If, the, if that's a cool thing, that's fine. But that might be really weird right now. Just walk around the surrounding area and ask God's spirit to create new pathways for you to engage with them more so than you ever have before. And then next week when we gather, we'll talk about what is our next sort of step in this process. Hey, so I'm going to um, open sort of our, our prayer time up here and, and uh, I'm going to dismiss this with a benediction. But I wanted to say that in our prayer time, we were believing that God was going to meet you where you were today. Not, we, that's how we prepared for you. We prayed the aisles, we prayed the chairs that God would meet you specifically where you might be today. So if you need encouragement, that God would, his spirit would be encouraging you. If you needed healing, that God would bring healing. If you needed conviction, that God would bring conviction. Whatever it is, that God would meet you exactly where you are today. And so our prayer partners are ready. And if you wanna come up and you just wanna ask for prayer in a certain area where you're wanting God to meet you so that that, motivate you to go out and meet others in that same way, we'd love to do that as we close. So why don't you stand for prayer and um, I'll give our benediction and we'll be dismissed. The only reason we do anything we do is to make it about Jesus. So let's remind ourselves that as we go, it's always to get the opportunity to walk people to the person of Jesus. So here's our benediction. If you're comfortable with it, you can, you can put your hands like this as though you were receiving a promise. And I want to declare a few promises over you. The God of hospitality and the God of grace promises to meet you right where you are. He promises to meet you in your depression, in your anxiety, in your addiction. He promises to meet you in your joy, in your happiness, in your contentment. He promises to meet you when your heart wanders and when your heart stays steadfast. The God of grace promises to meet you and know you and love you. And with these promises, I declare upon you, the God of hospitality promises to send you. May he keep you and make his face to shine upon you. Amen and amen. Love you guys.